Hello. Um, this is like me after work. So if I look tired and my makeup is not fresh, it's because I did it like 12 hours ago. But I wanted to film this video because I'm usually at work, very few days I work from home and it's become a little more difficult to find the time to film and schedule. But I read an interesting book and I want to talk about it. It's by Ruth Ozeki. This is not the one I read. I bought this after I started reading the other one. But the one I read is called A Tale for the Time Being. So this is the um book and i actually really like the cover more than that i love the spine of this and truthfully i'm happy that i read it as an audiobook because i didn't know much about this author one of you guys actually recommended it to me see i do read recommendations and sometimes when i read something and it just sounds so like one of your comments and it just sounds so inviting i get it immediately but i don't always jump on it i think because it's an audiobook i was like oh i'm traveling into work i'll pick it up and once I started reading it, I didn't really know anything before going into it, which is how I get into most books. But I was really shocked at, you know, what hit me. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for it, but also I'm very... I'd say I'm quite an experimental reader. I don't get easily put off by things or I don't find very heavy topics difficult to read. So it was okay. I read it... I want to say I finished reading it two weeks ago. The last two weeks have been crazy, but I also love just letting books dwell in my head for a while before I talk about them and I actually don't have any notes or anything for today's book uh, review but I just want to give you my honest opinion on what I thought about Ruth Ezeki as like first time reading her novel and why I plan to continue reading her other works because now I have this mammoth of a novel to read next. So like I said one of you recommended her book to me and it was in a comment that had a couple of other books which I also added to my TBR because they all sounded really I think it was the comment was more about like oh I see you've read a lot of Southeast Asian literature so you like these and I do struggle to find Southeast Asian literature that I like sounds intriguing recently I've read a couple that have been slightly underwhelming I was very taken by Miko Kawakami when she first debuted but mm, uh, not as much with Ruth Ozeki I didn't really I looked a little bit into the author but not as much as I really do a deep dive into some of them, simply because I heard that this book kind of functioned like an autofiction. <clears throat> That's the kind of vibe I got because the protagonist in this book is also called Ruth, and she's the same-ish age as the author. She's also an author. There are so many parallels between the actual author of this book, Ruth Ozeki, and the Ruth who is the protagonist of this book that I thought that reading too much about the author was going to kind of spoil the book itself. I don't know if it would have enhanced my reading experience, but I still enjoyed the book quite a lot. Um, before I get any deeper into this, I do want to say there is trigger warning for a ton of stuff, especially, you know, if you have like a problematic relationship with parents, a lot of bullying, a lot of unaliving yourself. Um, you, every topic you can think of that have been, you know, really put into the spotlight over the last decade that are issues in Japanese society have been tackled in this book. Be mindful of that. The book starts off with Ruth um, kind of taking a walk on the beach and she comes across, she lives on a island that is quite remote and a lot of things wash up on the shore and sometimes she picks them up to throw them in this case she runs into a little hello kitty lunchbox and inside there she finds a, a how do i say it? it's like kind of like a hidden diary with a bunch of letters and when she starts reading these letters she uncovers the story of now nao which is like short for naoko which is a very common um, Japanese name and from then on you see these two stories running by parallel one is Ruth telling you her story of living in this island and then there's Naoko who is a 16 year old girl I believe at the time this was written who is writing this book from the past um, and she's telling Riko <laughs> telling Ruth her story and you know it sounds pretty nice pretty wholesome but it really takes a turn um, from the very first chapter that Naoko writes. So her name itself is kind of like a play on words because the whole book is called A Tale for a Time Being. And Naoko says, hello, I'm now, I'm a time being. And you're a time being too. Anyone, any life that is relative to time is a time being. But the whole play on this is that at some point, 
both of their lives are kind of going on, right? They don't really coincide because one is in the past, one is in the future. But there almost feels like there's some sort of connection through time because of the way now is communicating. It almost feels like it's happening right then and there. And also her name, it's almost like now, but now. I don't know, the author tries to play with this a little bit, but I feel like it was not as good as the whole time being debacle. And I actually heard that or read up somewhere that time being is actually a concept um, that is not made up for this book, but it's a real concept. So I would look into that more if you're interested. Um, yeah, when Nao starts talking, she sat in a Japanese cafe. So she's sitting down in this maid cafe, which I did see one myself when I went to Japan. There's like girls dressed up as like, I don't know, just those sexy maid attires that are like very, very cliche. And they come and they serve customers. And the one I saw personally, there were lots of couples there. So I don't know what this one is like, but it seems like kind of like a hostess cafe. And she sat there, she's writing. And eventually as the story unrolls, you find out that now actually used to live in San Francisco with her dad, who was um, an engineer at the time of the dot-com boom. And when the dot-com bubble burst, um, they got essentially fired. They moved back to Japan, their life collapsed. And now her family is struggling to assimilate back into Japanese society. She herself identifies as an American because that's what she's always been. She doesn't really remember her life in Japan, so it's been very hard. She's very heavily bullied in school. And this, writing this book is her form of escaping the life that she's living and almost having a friend to talk to because it doesn't seem like she really has anyone. And if this sounds dark in itself, the turns that this book takes is just absolutely bizarre. Like, and But it's not unrealistic. I think this is the reason I like the book because sometimes you just feel like the main character is put into a jar and just rattle, like for no reason. Things just keep happening. But the series or the sequence of events that take place in here actually do seem like a very um, legit series of events that can happen to a girl of that age in her situation. So I do like the almost like unbelievably but harshly realistic aspect of the book. Um, another very cool part about this book is Nao's great-grandmother is a Buddhist monk um, and she lives in this temple in rural Japan and she has this little temple that she's like, she's like 104 years. And one summer when her dad is really not doing well mentally, she gets sent to spend the summer with, um, I forgot her name, Zico? I think it was Zico. Jiko? I'm sorry, I don't remember the name. We'll call her Jiko. So she was sent to um, this island and Nile and she was sent to the temple to spend time with Jiko and initially she was like what the hell am I gonna do without any network without any like laptops computers it's gonna be a whole summer of boredom and she was like really not looking forward to it and on the way there she even tells her dad like I want to go to Disneyland on the way there because like why are you dumping me there but in the time that she spends there she completely falls in love with this whole place because she learns about these little nuances of her great-grandmother and the way she did those things. She gets such a different perspective. And towards the end, she almost says like, oh, why don't we bring dad here? He's really struggling. And then, you know, in her time there, she actually learns a lot about her family heritage and her uncle, um, so her dad is called Haruki, but she learns about her uncle who is also called Haruki. So he's Haruki number one and her dad is Haruki number two. So she learns a lot about Haruki number one, who was the son of this great grandmother. But interestingly, he was a kamikaze pilot during World War II. So during this book, Ruth Ozeki also takes it, the opportunity to introduce you to the historical context of why these things are happening. Not just telling you that this is what Japanese society is like today, but also gives you a lot of like food for thought in terms of the backdrop of war but also where people sit in society today and how much that is influenced by everything that's happened when you think about the relationships with america and her being an american and how she was treated it all kind of comes full circle but she learns a lot about her heritage and she even kind of feels like she's experienced this supernatural encounter while she was there but as she comes home she's almost annoyed at her own father for not trying harder to live because she's like 
we had such great people in our family who stood up for so much and how can you um you know give up so easily and she also looks out on herself because when he was in the army her uncle got very heavily bullied and very heavily beat up and it's pretty damn gory and she's like oh if his um bullying was so bad then how you know i'm just gonna live through it i can suck it up i can take this much which is not entirely true oh my god i don't know why people grab like that which is not entirely true because she learns with time that actually it's not you know everything is not black and white like that she does realize with time that it's it was more complicated than that but in this time she is going through so much because she cannot really find the ropes to grasp on everything seems to be slipping away from her at the same time you go back to the narrator's life where you hear a bit of backstory about her how she used to be quite an accomplished author but she fell in love with this guy and then she moved into this remote island and she almost feels like time is slipping away from her and she's not moving anywhere she has a writer's block and now she's becoming more and more obsessed with this idea of Naoko and really meeting her and finding out like was this a real girl like whose diary is this I need to know who is this so she starts like she starts doing extreme things to look into uh, Naoko and who she is and her family and after a lot of research she finds out about um, Naoko's dad in and his time in San Francisco and he actually learns like this is a kind of a spoiler so I'm not gonna say it actually yeah, I'll leave that up. But she finds things out about um, Naoko and her family. And then from there, it kind of takes a bit of a Murakami-esque turn where it's like magical realism. I don't really care for that bit. But okay, I see like wait, there's a lot of criticism about this book at that point because there is magical realism into it and people kind of go, what the fuck? Magical realism sometimes almost feels like you're writing and you kind of reach a point where you can't think of a logical end of something and you just put something in there this kind of felt like that but because i've read so much magical realism i think i can let it pass but other than that i mean the sheer variety of like concepts introduced in this book and things to work with and also i'm someone who's quite familiar with japanese society as much as you can be from the outsider perspective i'm not someone who's like super fixated on like anime or one part of the culture but more of a holistic i enjoy several different aspects of it so as someone like that i enjoyed the aspects that this book highlighted and also maybe not demonized but just shed light on the fact that you know a lot of people romanticize so many aspects of so many different cultures but it's not as beautiful as it seems because when you look under the surface there's a lot of hidden ugliness to it so honestly i do think you should read it if you are someone who's enjoyed my recommendations in the past it's kind of the book that after you finish reading it you almost get a different sense of like a feeling to it but while reading it it might seem a little bit like you know like a stream of consciousness not just like a full blown thought because of the constant switching i did find naoko's part a lot more interesting to read than ruth's but i think that was done purposely that because it's kind of like a almost it's like run 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 and then just like hold you back and then you run around and you're like halt so that's the pacing that i felt i don't know if i loved that but the plot and the storytelling was really beautiful that's all for today i hope you enjoyed this review i am excited to read her next book this is called the book of form and emptiness and my boyfriend saw this the other day and he was like that sounds so depressing i didn't even see i went on to amazon and i just picked the first Rufuziki book that was available um and i didn't actually pay attention to what the, the all the titles are very long and very similar but i guess this is going to be another depressing read but i hope it's fun. And the print is tiny cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll see you next time. Take care.